This episode of Eat the Rules is brought to you by You on Fire. You on Fire is the online group coaching program that I run that gives you a step-by-step way of building up your self-worth beyond your appearance. With personalized coaching from me, incredible community support, and lifetime access to the program so that you can get free from body shame and live life on your own terms. Get details on what's included and sign up for the next cycle at summerinandin.com forward slash you on fire. I'd love to have you in that group. This is Eat the Rules, a podcast about body image, self-worth, anti-dieting, and intersectional feminism. I am your host, Summer Inanin, a professionally trained coach specializing in body image, self-worth, and confidence, and the best-selling author of Body Image Remix. If you're ready to break free of societal standards and stop living behind the number on your scale, then you have come to the right place. Welcome to the show. This is episode 219, and... We are talking all about the myths about diabetes and how to manage it from a health at every size perspective. I am joined by registered dietitians, Glennis Oyston and Rebecca Scritchfield, creators of the Self Care for Diabetes program. We're talking all about how to manage everything from pre diabetes to diabetes from a health at every size perspective. As well, we're unpacking all the myths about diabetes diabetes, whether you need to be concerned if you're genetically predisposed to diabetes, what it means to be pre-diabetic, whether you need to cut out carbs to manage blood sugar, and changes that you can make if you are pre-diabetic or concerned about your blood sugar or have diabetes without triggering the diet mentality. You can find all the links and resources mentioned at summerinandin.com forward slash 219. First, I want to give a shout out to Allison222, who left this review. I love listening to this podcast. Summer is brilliant, inspiring, funny, and extremely knowledgeable. I gain so much from each and every podcast, and they inspire me to keep being a diet and beauty culture rebel. Keep up the great work, Summer. Thank you so much, Allison. I really, really appreciate you leaving that review. If you haven't already done so, take a minute to leave a review for the show. You can do that by going to Apple Podcasts or iTunes, I should say, search for Eat the Rules, then click Ratings and Reviews and click to leave a review. You can also help me out by subscribing to the show. I would be so grateful if you did that. It takes two seconds via whatever platform you use. And don't forget to grab the free 10 day body confidence makeover at summerinandin.com forward slash freebies with 10 steps to take right now to feel better in your body. This episode has a lot of meat and potatoes in it. So we're going to dive right in. It is basically everything you need to know about diabetes and blood sugar. I get these questions all the time from people who are, you know, worried about getting diabetes because they're living a more anti-diet lifestyle or that, you know, they've, they're newer to intuitive eating or they're predisposed to diabetes or their doctor has told them they're pre-diabetic. And there, there's so many myths out there. There's a lot of terrible advice out there. And I'm so, so grateful for Glennis and Rebecca for really being the experts on this subject matter. They're my go-to if I have any questions or clients with diabetes. And they've created this amazing online program called Self Care for Diabetes, which is a program program designed to help you either manage diabetes or pre-diabetes, or if you're just concerned about being genetically predisposed to diabetes and you want to do make some changes to potentially prevent the onset of diabetes, then they've created this amazing anti-diet haze aligned online program called Self-Care for Diabetes. They're going to talk about it more throughout this episode. There's links in the show notes, both to one, a free download that they have called the seven surprising myths about diabetes and weight, which I would highly recommend because I downloaded it and I was like blown away by some of the myths. (laughs) Like there's just so much mainstream advice out there around diabetes and weight. That's, that's incorrect. So the free download as well, they have a self care for diabetes program. Both of those things are in the show notes for this episode at summer forward slash two one nine. So first 
not first. I mean, they're both guests. So Glennis Oyston is one of the guests. She is a registered dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor who helps people recover from eating and body image problems created by toxic diet culture through the non-diet eating approach. She is the co-host of the Dietitians Unplugged podcast and is a co-creator of the Haze Aligned online program, Self Care for Diabetes. You can connect with Glennis at daretonotdiet.com. Rebecca Scritchfield is a, also a registered dietitian, nutritionist, certified health and fitness specialist, and author of the book Body Kindness, lauded by the New York Times Book Review as Simple and True and Publishers Weekly calls A Rousing Guide to Better Health. Through her weight-neutral, mindfulness-based counseling practice, she helps people create a better life with workable goals that fit individual interests. I want to say that both Glennis and Rebecca have been on the show before. Uh, Rebecca was on, they were both on like a long time ago, like 2016, 2017, I think. Episodes 80, episode 80 was with Rebecca Scritchfield, and we were talking about tending to health without triggering the diet brain. And episode 60 was with Glennis, diet, weight loss, and health bullshit we were blowing up. (laughs) Still blowing it up today. (laughs) Um, You can find links to both of those old episodes because you won't be able to find them on iTunes or Spotify because they're over 100 episodes ago. But they're both available through my website. You can just go to the show notes for this episode and and find links to both of those or just Google somewhere in an interview with Glennis or interview with Rebecca and you'll find it. They're both some of my favorite people, some of my favorite uh, dietitians to follow. And I think you're going to really love this, this episode. Let's get started with the show. Hello, Glennis and Rebecca. Welcome to the show. Hey, Summer. Hi. Hi, I'm so excited to have you both here. I am really looking forward to this episode. I get questions from people all the time about diabetes and health. And uh, I just think it's like such an important topic where, as you both know, there's a lot of kind of myths out there or misinformation. And and yet it's like such a common health struggle or something that people really are concerned about. So I'm pumped to kind of get into the nitty gritty and, and like what you've learned in doing all of your research around it and working with clients. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Having us here to talk about this. Great. Okay, well, let's, I mean, let's just start off with off with like, why? I mean, what made you both decide to create the program self care for diabetes? Like, why did you feel there was a need for this? What did you run into with your clients? Yeah, well, I'll start. Uh, This is Rebecca. My, this actually started probably years ago, my mom has diabetes, and she's had diabetes for a very long time. So as her supportive daughter, who was, you know, first learning about health through movement, and then became a dietitian. I was always trying to, you know, sort of help her care for herself and, you know, what she went through from the medical community, the weight stigma, the the shame, it was unbelievable and very, very frustrating. It decreased her sense of confidence and hope that she could make positive changes, frankly. And it really grew out of frustration from that. She also was a chronic dieter, you know, since a young age, and she even had an eating disorder that went undiagnosed for years. And so personally, I just got very frustrated with, you know, why are we dehumanizing people with our approach to diabetes? Everything is about weight loss and, oh, you must have done this to yourself. And so I, I thought this is an opportunity to help create some type of a healing space for people where they can get the information that they want Um, to help with their diabetes concerns, but in a way that is centered around compassion and helps with shame resilience. And Glennis is someone I've looked up to for years, and she has such a strong clinical background. And I thought, A, I'm not doing this alone because I hate working by myself. And B, who would I really trust could, you know, also help build me something from the ground up. And um, so we started with live groups at first, and our biggest problem was they wanted more time and the, uh, time zone scenarios, right? They wanted it to be more workable. And eventually, we evolved into the model that we have now. And I'll let Glenna share a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, Rebecca approached me with the idea. She said, you know what there is not enough of is health at every size for diabetes care. We know lots of dietitians do it, but there is not really, I don't think there was a program out there that was really doing it. And so we started with the groups and they were really successful. And we said, well, we just have a lot more information we want to deliver to 
on so many different aspects of health, but the groups we kind of limited in time and what we could talk about. And so we said, well, but there's so much more to self-care with diabetes, which is what ended up being the name of our program. And, you know, we've got 14 modules of, of self-care that range from, sure, the eating stuff, which everybody wants to know about, but talking about boundaries, like the holidays are coming up. So, you know, boundaries and stress management. And so it's really, really, really comprehensive. Yeah, I think I also had an interest in my family. I have a family history of diabetes. I worked in clinical care for a long time with a lot of people with diabetes. And uh, it just seemed like a kind of very exciting thing to do. And when Rebecca said, let's, hey, let's do this, I said, okay. And I just kept saying, okay, ever since then. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I mean, Glennis, you know, you're, you've always been someone that I refer people to as, as when they need some kind of a dietitian and specifically around diabetes as well. So uh, I think it is like, it's such a much needed thing. One of the things that you mentioned, Rebecca, when you were talking was just, you know, this that people really feel like they must have done this to themselves. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned like how a component of what you do when you're working with people in your program is is shame resiliency, which I thought was really interesting and important and just something that like, you know, I don't think a lot of people think about. Um, and yet it's probably something that's really universal is this idea that like, you know, people blame themselves and they think like, oh, I did this to myself. How do you address that with people? Well, I would say that when it, it comes up every month in our live group support. So we'll have a new member and they'll talk about their experience of how they even received their diagnosis. And we're, I think that we're, we're holding a space where we can acknowledge and validate that they're not wrong in their experiences and their feelings are valid. And the other thing that we'll do is we'll, we'll open it up to the community members like, we know that natural instinct, right? They're the experts. We're paying them. Let's let them talk. And we'll just sit here and take our notes. And the very first thing we say is like, y'all are the experts in your experiences and in your own body. And we want to hear from everybody sharing. And I really do believe that that connected community where people are willing to listen and share their story, they do, they're not just hearing that your feelings are valid. They're being validated by seeing that they're not alone and that, that this isn't something to be ashamed of and that they can move forward. And so they're often supporting each other with strategies for dealing with medical weight stigma or sharing maybe a strategy that helped them overcome a problem with sleep, so to speak. So I think just that uh, baseline, even letting folks know that diabetes has an unknown etiology and, you know, really it's unknown. I always thought, you know, and, and I think it's just general in our culture. We believe that, I mean, there's books that are multimillionaire books that say every bite of food either adds to your health or takes it away. So if we're buying and reading those books, we definitely think that 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 was the last brownie that did it. <laughs> and that's, I say that as a joke with a laugh, but that is actually really true. People think I shouldn't have had those breakfast bagels or whatnot. And that is not at all the case. We, we know that there's a strong genetic link and that's just a mix of what you're born with things completely outside of your control. And that idea that there is a, something that you did or didn't do and you know, you are the cause, then you are to blame. That is one of the first things that we have to tackle, especially if we're going to have any sort of positive emotions and sense of calm clarity to move forward on what would that next step look like? Yeah. Wow. You know, just hearing you say diabetes has an unknown etiol etiol etiology. Am I saying that word correctly? Is yeah, that means we don't know where it comes from. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and I'm like, what? Cause I didn't even know that. So I think let's unpack that a bit because I think the biggest thing that people assume is that it's really tied to their weight or they assume that like they need to lose weight or watch their weight in order to treat or prevent diabetes. So can you, can one of you just, you know, kind of blow that one up and, and speak to that and, and just really kind of tell everyone like what, what the research really says about that? The first thing we know is it diabetes has a huge genetic component, so it's highly inheritable. So usually if somebody has a family history, that's maybe the person who wants to think about, okay, that might be something that's either in my future or something I have to think about. With We're speaking specifically about type 2 diabetes, and that is is very, very inheritable. So first of all, you have to have that 
probably you have to have that genetic link. And then the other piece of it is where we're blaming it on weight. We don't really know the connection. We don't fully know the connection between insulin resistance and weight. But a lot of what is coming out now is that weight doesn't cause insulin resistance, or at least we're not sure that it does. It's likely that insulin resistance might increase weight gain. So it's sort of the opposite of what everybody's been told. Like, you know, you're getting bigger, you're, you're going to cause diabetes for yourself, which is, I mean, completely untrue and ridiculous. We also have to look at the fact that, you know, there are many, many people in larger bodies that don't have diabetes. I work almost exclusively, not on purpose, it just happens, this is the way it happens, but in my practice with people with um, in larger bodies, and most of them don't have diabetes. The folks that do usually have a strong family history. So it's just something that has, I mean, that's born of weight stigma, this idea that if you're in a larger body, you're causing disease for yourself. And we just don't have the evidence to say that. And I would add the other interesting thing is that you can have a really nice, long, happy and healthy life with a diabetes diagnosis, like the longevity and all the things that you wish for before diabetes, you can have all of that. And, you know, through positive self-care measures, and it's not an obligation to change anything, but for anyone who's open to the idea of learning more about how to work with their body, right? So when you can understand what's happening with the diabetes diagnosis, what are the ways that I could help my body do its jobs, right? And then looking at self-care through that lens, if you're curious about that, you can make changes that really will enhance your life and help you have more energy, feel better and feel better about the steps that you're taking, that they help you, you know, feel good and feel good about what you're doing. And it's especially important because anytime you're working with anyone who has a chronic dieting history or an eating disorder history, it's like the last thing in the world they want is to do something that's going to put them on the diet road again, or put them on the eating disorder road again. And so there's this high level of fear of, wait a minute, does approaching exercise with a different viewpoint, does that feel like it could be down the slippery slope of eating disorder? Does that feel like restriction and dieting again? And that, you know, we need to hold space for that and help others heal and learn and grow and to feel the difference and have that better understanding that that this is different. It's not me dieting. It's not going back to an eating disorder. It's me being fully in charge of my choices with a little bit of understanding and, and the full autonomy of what is it that I want? I'm in charge of the next step. What is it that I want? Yeah, that's so good what you both said there. And so like, what would your advice be to someone who has doc- whose doctor has said to them, you know, you need to lose weight because of your diagnosis. How would you suggest that they approach that situation? Oh, oh my gosh. So first of all, <laughs> come join our program, first of all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have to look at how that could be such a harmful piece of advice, right? We know, number one, that weight loss is a kind of a, a losing proposition for most people. That was a terrible pun unintentional one, but basically most people can lose weight for a short period of time and a long period of, you know, the long range, of course, you know, we all know, everybody gains it back. And then the other piece of that is that we also know that dieting and losing weight is an inflammatory process. Janet Tamiyama did the research around cortisol, increased cortisol, and the physiological stress of diets. When you pair that with the, the fact that diabetes is an inflammatory condition, you're kind of setting up a really bad situation for people. And what usually happens is when people try to lose weight, it does mask the symptoms of diabetes. So you might see a reduction in blood sugars, but when it inevitably fails, what I see in my practice over and over again is when people kind of, when that diet kind of breaks and the weight starts coming back, the blood sugars get much worse in in that period of time. And then what I see is when they normalize their eating again, the blood sugars get better. And so I think what we're seeing when we see blood sugars get worse is the effects of that. I happen to think the effects of the diet, the inflammatory process of that diet. And it was just masking. It didn't really, it didn't make diabetes go away. It didn't really make it long-term better. And then of course it wasn't sustainable. So even if it was working for a while, the actions aren't sustainable. So I would say I would 
you know, how somebody handles that out of the doctor is completely up to them. Um, it's a really vulnerable moment for most people. And they might deal with it by saying, you know, okay, thanks for the advice. And then go and seek something out else out that is, you know, non-diet in orientation, like our program or like a non-diet dietitian. You know, if somebody wants to say, hey, what is the, you know, what's the evidence around this? It just depends on somebody's level of sort of confidence of the doctor. Mo most of us are in pretty vulnerable positions. Even I don't like to challenge my doctor. So, but I would say really you want to look at the evidence for how long that is going to work to control diabetes. Again, we know that most people gain weight back within three to five years. And so that's not really going to address the problem. You can also do really terrible things to lose weight. Um, one of the things I saw when I was in, was becoming a dietitian was a gentleman who lost um, a handful of weight when he first got his diabetes diagnosis, but his numbers were really out of control. And I said, well, what did you do? And he said, I started juicing everything. And of course, he's just getting juice, no protein, no fat, no fiber, no actual food. He's just getting juice, kind of mainlining, you know, just kind of pure, unadulterated sugar, um, even if it was mixed with diabetes. And I'm not saying sugar in a bad way. It's more just like, wow, you really weren't getting any other nutrients in there to balance that out. So, you know, that didn't, that weight loss didn't help him because what he was doing was also really uh, difficult for his body to manage. So of course, I would always say that that's, that recipe for weight loss is just a recipe for disaster when it comes to health in general and diabetes specifically. Mm -hmm. I was a speaker at a conference in Maryland well, at this point now, it was probably a couple of years ago, pre-COVID. <laughs> and, uh, but it was, you know, kind of cutting edge research around diabetes. And so for people who worked in the hospital or in the clinical setting, and I was speaking on health at every size and I was sandwiched between the doctor speaking on intermittent fasting and ketogenic diets. <laughs> so I was so excited to be there. I'd be the peanut butter and jelly in the inside of the sandwich. But what I found fascinating in both talks is that yeah, they were sharing, you know, sort of how you do these sort of small groups and these sort of short term positive outcomes. And both of them, what they acknowledge is we have a strong lack of evidence for any benefit two years out. We don't have the studies. And in the few studies we do have, once you follow someone for about two years out, any short term benefits from somebody following this diet um, did not sustain. And they, so at least they actually laid it out there for all of us. So even sort of the hottest, trendiest, who knows what your doctors are going to say. I mean, we hear these experiences like, oh, I did this. You should too. And let's hope that it's, you know, not everybody's bad. I get it. But I feel like that, you know, what we tend to see is people avoiding the doctor. You really need to get your labs. So if you can do our group, we can help set you up for that. But even if you're not quite ready for that, or, you know, you could listen to some of our podcasts where we might be able to help give you some tips or advice on how to prepare for that appointment. Reagan Chastain is great stuff. And, you know, often they're talking about, please give me the advice you would give a thinner person. That is the information that I would like. But any amount of preparing that you could do for what is likely a difficult conversation, at least you're not avoiding the data of the labs and avoiding that very scary step, but that step of, I, I need to have a medical conversation because I myself am not a doctor. And just remember that you get to be fully in charge of your next choices, even if you know what you're dealing with feels uncertain. You are still going to be fully in charge of what to do next. Yeah, that's great. I, Gladys, you said uh, that dieting is inflammatory. And I, yeah, I don't think I, I mean, I knew it was harmful in many ways, but I don't think I'd ever heard it phrased in that way. And I just think that that's, I mean, everything you both said was so important mm -hmm. there, but I just mm -hmm. wanted to circle back to that one point because I was like, oh, I did not realize that. Just so important. Right. I mean, there's, there's research to show that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and again, I, I mentioned Janet Tamiyama is the one that always comes to my mind because that was like, Ooh, that's really exciting. She, she, you know, took measurements of the hormones from people's mouths on like cotton swabs and, or, you know, cotton balls and measured the amount of cortisol, which is a stress hormone that people went through when they were dieting or when they were just pretending to diet, like journaling. And what she found was that there was quite a bit of physiological stress when people restricted. And I think that that we are seeing the effects of that, you know, in a big, in a big way, uh, with people's health and, and, and how it's really impacted people so negatively. 
Yeah. So yeah, I mean, one of the things that you were mentioning there, Rebecca, was around being sandwiched between like, you know, the keto guy or the intermittent fasting guy or whoever. I do think it's like, it's such a common assumption that people make that they need to do low carb, or they need to like, you know, cut out all sugars if they have this diagnosis, or if they're looking to prevent it. So, you know, what are your what are your thoughts on, on that that approach? Like, is that necessary to kind of cut back on carbohydrates or, or sugars? Like, how how do you suggest people approach that? Well, with respect to food, we handled it through several different um, modules because it's almost like depends on the slice of the pie that you're taking, right? We wanted to include basic nutrition education, right? Just talking about lentils and what they have, but not sort of giving anyone a PhD degree in legumes, <laughs> You know, and, and just so talking about and talking about ways that you could use it. So a little bit of nutrition education, we centered it around this idea of like a meal mix, you know, where if you include a variety or think of flavors that might go together, think of some of your favorite foods and how you might pair them up that by, you know, we have this phrase we use often around food, pleasure is the measure. So think about what you like. You don't have to eliminate anything that you like, right? But, you know, you might examine, for example, folks in our group, you know, we'll kind of talk about before going through our content is just they had a, you know, simple habit of skip and breakfast. But what they realized that when they had you know, some eggs in the morning that they felt better and they had more energy and they could focus better. And it's kind of that led to like, you know, some small changes to their meal mix and lunch and this and that. And so it's, we don't want people to be afraid of the idea of making changes if they remember that they're fully in charge of that. Um, absolutely no, as far as like low carb or like being restrictive in types of carbs. And if anything, I would say that if you think about, Ways in which you might have thought about taking time out of your day doesn't have to be like an hour long lunch, but how rushed you could be around lunchtime that, you know, if you had about 10 minutes or so to like appreciate the day, appreciate this break, right? To connect to yourself again and enjoy what you're eating, right? And connect to it, that, that, that can help bring positive emotions, a sense of calm, a sense of like stress relief. And it's not like mindful eating to control yourself. You have to eat, you know, less, but it's this idea that there are things that you could do that can make your life better, that, that might help you feel more grounded and connected and workable. So I've had, you know, people who have talked about, they, you know, love going out to eat and love going out for Mexican food. And without, it wasn't even a conversation in our room, but they literally had the idea of, I really enjoy most a lot of these things that are on the inside and the tortilla chips. And so just by kind of making their own tortilla chips with the fajita stuff and kind of choosing what they wanted, but just thinking about the meal mix that they talked about, they got to drive the car, they really enjoyed the food, they did not feel anything was deprivation, and that they did notice like, you know, that it was a better blood sugar reading. And that meant something at that time because the fear is I'm never going to be able to improve my blood sugar readings around food and eat foods that I enjoy. So there's, we encourage a lot of self-discovery and experimenting and a lot of curiosity. I mean, it's within somebody's autonomy to like go low carb, but I certainly wouldn't recommend it. I think that there's a lot of potential negative downsides. It's not up to me to say what people can and can't do with their bodies, but there's certainly no scientific evidence around it. And The other thing I would say about that before moving on is that we often don't take time when we think about exercise and diabetes, it's usually in terms of weight loss, as opposed to how movement helps our body use the foods more efficiently and helps, it especially helps um, our cells work better with insulin. And, you know, we can talk more about that if you're interested in, but it's really fascinating to see that it's not just that sort of calories in calories out dialogue when it comes to diabetes. Yeah, that's, that's really important. Like, um, I think what I'm hearing you say is that it's, it's really not like a one size fits all thing. And that the approach is really about like looking to kind of almost like diversify and add variety and 
in order it from a place of like pleasure and approach it with curiosity to like just see how things kind of work out with your blood sugars and things like that versus like kind of taking this classic restrictive, you know, okay, you need to do a low carb approach, like you got to cut out all sugar. And so it's really refreshing to hear that it's possible to manage diabetes from a way that's not restrictive, and especially of carbohydrates. Yeah. I also wanted to say that even if let's say that cutting out or going low carb with carbohydrates worked, I know so few people who could do that long term that it essentially ends up being kind of an ineffective intervention for most people. You know, tiny handful of people that maybe they can do that. That's fine. But most people can't do that. And then what happens is we set up that deprivation binge cycle where people are feeling bad that, oh, I had carbs because I really wanted them. And then they ate them and they're feeling bad. And the worse they feel, the harder it is to just feed yourself. When in reality, what we've both seen is when people start to just have regular meals and think about balance a little bit, okay, I want to include a few different foods and really focusing on what's satisfying, that people do a lot better and that they can do that long term. And you hit it on the head, which is this isn't, we're really encouraging people to find their own way with what works for them, which is why we have self-assessments um, built into the program to sort of figure out like, what is it that you, the individual needs, because not everybody can do exactly what everybody else can do. So. This episode is brought to you by Riverside, the leading podcast and video recording platform. And it's the platform that I use to record this podcast. I used to use Skype, remember them? And then I was interviewed for a podcast using Riverside and I knew I had to make the switch. I love Riverside because it's as easy to use as Zoom, but I can record much higher quality audio and video on their platform. And what's amazing is it doesn't matter where my guest is located, it sounds like they're sitting in the room with me. After recording, I can do so many cool post-production things like download separate audio and video tracks or use the Riverside platform to easily edit the content and create video clips. All those cool video clips that you see on social media all with a few clicks. I'm so glad I made the switch. It's super easy to use. There's a reason why so many creators use Riverside. Check them out and all of the other features they have at riverside.fm. You can create an account and use code ETR to get $10 off your subscription. Get started today by going to riverside.fm to check it out. There is a link in the show notes. And if you use code ETR, you'll get $10 off your subscription. Yeah, great. That's amazing. So you mentioned movement there uh, when you were talking, Rebecca, and just about how to kind of coming away from that old paradigm of like, you move to burn calories to therefore help. So like, how how do you see movement kind of facilitating someone with helping with like blood sugars and things like that? And how would how would they kind of do it differently, I guess, versus kind of the old school approach, which is like, more is better? (laughs) Yeah, your pace is the pace, certainly. And this idea of you know, I'm, I also have training as an exercise physiologist. And so even I just, some simple things like there's components of frequency, how often you do something, the intensity, you know, how challenging is it in that moment and the duration, you know, and that also physical fitness is cardio strength and flexibility. So we, we, in a recent group call, right. We're talking with someone who is concerned about inadequate sleep. And we talked about, well, what is, what is it that you think you're missing while you're struggling with your sleep. And she talked about low daytime energy and wishing she had more energy to exercise. And so, you know, we went, before we went through the problem solving the sleep, I said, well, you know, did you know that exercise includes cardio strength and flexibility? I wonder what it would feel like to find some very short stretching videos and start this nighttime stretching routine. That's, that's exercise, right? You know, and so when you're feeling low energy, something might help you ease into bed and say, you know what, I've got to validate. I am approaching exercise and I wasn't doing it yesterday. And it was, you know, again, a lot of people, they feel their mind is blown because they have this vision of like a Stairmaster or a treadmill in some dark space somewhere. And it's just, you know, not a place where they want to be. And so, you know, I do think that allowing, think of like the least 
amount that you would want to start with and pick that, you know, that it could be five minutes of, you know, playing a fun song that you really like, and you just want to feel your body and move your body. But I think that in terms of another big thing in terms of exercise, it's like knowing that there are immediate benefits for how your body responds and uses up blood sugars that can, that are way outside of, you know, any fraction of weight loss. And also that because we have such a negative and painful history with movement, that this is a chance to do a piece of work where we can reframe it. We can have new words to use and a new approach to use and that we don't have, you know, we might have memory of negative experience with exercise. And so how do we recognize that as it might feel similar because I am, you know, doing a 10 minute beginner resistance band video. It might feel similar. I'm feeling my heart rate up, but this is not the same thing as doing punishing exercise. So a lot of people are avoiding it because of time barriers, but also because of the the negative painful history with it. And when they feel like approaching a positive change, you need to know that your pace is the pace. Any amount that you're curious of trying and seeing what was that experience like, that's a good piece of data for you to move forward. And I don't know, Glennis, I feel like they're just kind of, they're all doing something different and they just kind of go at their own, through their own experience, just almost like we're just creating the container for it. And then they just kind of do their thing. Yeah. It's amazing when you take the restraint off around, like you have to have that weight loss outcome from exercise. And once it becomes about, well, actually it really just has to feel good for you. I find people are really going for it and experimenting and figuring out what feels good for them. And I'm, I'm one of those people that's like, I'm, my relationship to exercise was very fraught, like all of us, but I'm still not somebody who's like, I love working out. It's like, no, I have to do it because I feel good when I do it. So I think between Rebecca, who I think you love exercise in a way that like, I will never be able to love it. I like movement and how it makes me feel. And so I really appreciate the struggle that people have where it's like, well, this might not be the thing we do. I do forever, but let, let's bring a sense of curiosity to it and see what feels good and what works out for you right now. And I think people are doing it once, once they start to feel like one, this is not an obligation and two, it really just needs to make you feel good. Yeah. So important. It's another key area where people are helping each other out too, right? So they're sharing their personal experiences and they're getting a lot of collective healing through the conversations. They're meeting each other. They're getting collective healing. And that I feel that it's great that we have the education and the information and this container of emotional support. But again, in that story sharing element, it's like there's there are just things that Glennis and I could never do, no matter how many CEUs we get in our career. Nothing helps in the healing like a shared group type of experience. Yeah, 100%. I fully, fully agree with that. That's why I only focus on doing groups now because (laughs) smart. (laughs) I just saw how powerful it is. It does. It's like it does. It almost yeah, it's like it's like putting gasoline on the fire for somebody. It just it it does. It adds Mm -hmm. so much. So okay, so a, a huge question that I think a lot of people have is around pre diabetes. So What is your advice to somebody who has, maybe their doctor has told them that they have prediabetes? Yeah, let's phrase it like that. What is your advice to someone whose doctor has told them that they have prediabetes? Well, we look at what the typical advice is, unfortunately, Um, across the board seems to be lose five to 10% of your weight. Again, which is, it sounds deceptively simple, but again, most people are going to try that uh, and not be able to maintain it for a long, long term. Really, What I, what we advise in general is like, it's good self-care, right? It's eating in a supportive way that feels good, being curious about, oh, what, you know, adding in foods, coming back to that intuitive or mindful eating and paying attention to how things make you feel, getting enough sleep, managing your stress. And that's a huge one that came up in our, our recent group where people didn't realize that stress impacts blood sugars. And it's a huge impact on blood sugars and really just focusing on really good self-care and just seeing what it is that might be missing and what it is that a person could add in, you know, getting that movement, 
it's really not that different than anything we'd recommend for somebody who just is looking for ways to take care of themselves in general. And it's important to remember that prediabetes isn't diabetes, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to progress. It's a it's a pretty small percentage of people that actually progress on towards to, to diabetes. And so really helping that stress management, that fear that people have around, oh gosh, I've, I've already been given the pre-death sentence kind of thing. And just, yeah, just really focusing on shame reduction and just all the aspects of self-care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have folks who join who have, a, you know, my doctors talk to me about diabetes, some Anna have a family history, you know, and I think we're really, I think, again, one of the things that's when you join, it's like you get immediate access to all the modules and stuff you could just do on your own. When we gather in the group conversation, I also think it just helps because it's like we're all human beings together, right? And we're all connecting to each other. And it's almost like the diagnoses just kind of fade away. So some will disclose that they have an eating disorder history or that they, you know, like other things in their history. And we welcome that, you know, we always want to hear about your pain and, and how we can help. But yeah, it's, it feels kind of labelless in a lot of ways. And, and I think that if we look at what that pre-diabetes, it's that fear mongering, it's the warning from the doctors. And if, if anything, I think that this is, we really are dominantly talking about self-care. It's just in a group of people who have diabetes or concerns about diabetes. And, you know, it's been a really great experience just watching folks, you know, on their journeys. And it's funny. Some people be like, oh, I bought this device online and I know, I know I shouldn't. I know because it's less than dieting devices. <laughs> and we're like, send it back. And so sometimes we're just, you know, emotionally supporting each other and what they know they need to do and to sort of, you know, feel less alone and less on their own. Yeah. I, when I downloaded your, what's it called? Seven myths, seven myths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's their full, yeah. Seven. Uh, the health expert. Yeah. 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 Right. The surprising. Yeah. yeah seven surprising myths about, yeah. <laughs> Medical doctors won't tell you, but we're going to tell you seven diabetes myths. Yeah. So I actually just copied and pasted the stat for the prediabetes because, because you mentioned it there, just only a small percentage progress, but it was like, according to the CDC's own data, 2% of people with prediabetes will progress to diabetes annually and 10% within five years, which I was like, I found quite shocking because I think most people assume it's like, it's like once you have that prediabetes label, it's like, oh, like that's it. And so I, f- I just wanted to call that number out because to me, it felt really important. And I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. Right. And the other thing that a re- another recent piece of information I saw is how overdiagnosed prediabetes might be because doctors are di- uh, diagnosing it with either one, one of two readings. So either your A1C is going into the, into the prediabetes range, which starts at 5.7%. Um, Here in the U.S., it's different in Canada. I believe it starts at 6.0% A1C, unless they've changed it. And if they're just using that, I know. (laughs) Sorry, Summer. What is it now? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Just kidding. Just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) But if doctors are just using that number to diagnose, or they're just using fasting glucose to diagnose Pre-diabetes, which I've had clients say, oh, my doctor said I'm in and you know, I have prediabetes now and all they tested was the fasting uh, blood glucose. They're overdiagnosing it something like 73% by 73%. If they diagnose it using both of those numbers, the fasting blood glucose and the A1C, they're finding that uh, diabetes, oh, sorry, prediabetes only gets diagnosed about 25% of the time. And what they found was that most people of that 25% don't really go on to develop diabetes. So we have a case of it's possible prediabetes is being way overdiagnosed um, just because we're not using enough enough data. And so again, it's it's the fear mongering, I think, with prediabetes that, you know, is going on that's it's putting terror in people's hearts. And you don't look you don't look after yourself well when you're filled with shame and fear. And so what we really tried to do in, a, in the program, it's one of the reasons we put like a module about shame as our first, our very first module, you know, dealing with diagnosis, shame, that once, once you can decrease that shame around what's going on, then people actually look, look after themselves 
can look after themselves better. Yeah, so important. I I want to do just a bit of like rapid fire questions from the audience, <laughs> if that's okay with you. I know this episode's a little bit longer, but I wanted to cover all the bases and um, give you an opportunity to kind of speak to the most typical things that come up. So, okay, first one, why can I eat the same foods every day, but my blood sugar reacts differently? So my first question is, are we really eating the same, same foods every single day? Uh, you know, so checking the facts on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the amount of sleep you're getting, stress, um, how good is the the reader? How good are the test strips, <laughs> you know? And just sometimes it's like, that's what's interesting about diabetes. We have no idea. So you look for trends you know, in fact, when in our modules on measuring blood sugars, we have this self-reflection as like, might you be measuring too much? Might you want to take a break? And folks have. And so, you know, there could be even whatever kind of difference in, you know, the meal mix that's on the plate that could just shift those numbers ever so slightly. So my hunch is, is that there's probably not a giant gap in the readings, but when you're just looking at a certain number, it feels like a difference or you're wishing for more tighter precision. And it's just doesn't really work that way. The body is not as, uh, you know, it's not like a calculator, I guess would be the way to explain it. Yeah. I was going to say there is variance in, in testing. And a few groups I'm in online, Mm -hmm. people are saying like, Hey, I got this test, this reading in one second and I took it literally 30 seconds later, and it's like really different. And so it really depends on the accuracy of your of your glucometer, and your test strips, and you can have old test strips, and you can have, you know, a lot of uh, even the calculator is not the calculator we want it to be because our, you know, again, our body's not a machine, like Rebecca said. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I was I was just thinking, like, (laughs) Rebecca, to your point about do you really eat the same thing every day? Because it's like, if you're pouring olive oil on something, or you're putting butter on something, like, it's like, you don't really know the exact amount, like it could, it could create a variance. And, and so yeah, I like, I'm assuming this person's not weighing and measure everything, everything, let's hope not. (laughs) But I suppose that, that there could easily be variance there, too. Yeah. And sleep and stress. And we, we, ju- in our recent group call, everyone's, you know, just talking about like what a year it was. Right. And the variation in stress levels and, and as things got better and their A1Cs got better and they're like, we have no idea what's working. It's like, doesn't matter what, how are you making life better? And it, it dovetails into that pre-diabetes mention is like, rather than the fear monitoring, if you're thinking about what changes would make my life better, how much does the diagnosis really matter? How much does that blood sugar really matter if your focus is on self-care, you know? Yeah, that's great. Okay, another question. Can we ever outrun our genetics when it comes to something like diabetes or will it eventually catch up with us? You know, I think that's something we don't know fully the answer to. I think that, and, you know, check in with me in 20 years because I have a family history, (laughs) decently strong family history, right? Me too. And I'll let you know, but, but the way, you know, the way I look at it and like Rebecca said early on, even if I did get a diagnosis of diabetes, somebody gets that diagnosis, you can have a really good long life, you know, with good self-care, with proper medication management. And to me, it's not about outrunning my genetics, but seeing that as, oh, Hey, I have this in my family history and my genetics. The thing I want to do is take the best possible self care, you know, with my health, you know, I want to make sure I'm getting regular movement while I can, you know, if there's a chance, can you stave it off? Probably, possibly. I think it's something we don't fully know the answer to. Can you make sure you never get it? I don't know. I've had relatives that were diagnosed in their 70s. So it's like it came along, you know, quite late. I had relatives diagnosed much earlier. And I think to me, the focus is less running away from it because that's such a fear-based thing and more, hey, I'm going to take the best possible care of myself and just see what happens and focusing less on the fear. That's great. Love it. Okay. Last question. So what is the best way for someone to manage diabetes when they're triggered by a restriction or an eating plan? In other words, like, is it possible to manage diabetes from a health at every size or intuitive eating perspective? Heck yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, it, it's, I'm like, yes. And that's why we're here. We're here to help. But, um, I mean, a hundred percent, I mean, you're your own best caregiver. That caregiver voice is not always, um, dominant in your mind because of everything you've been through in life. 
but we can learn and grow and heal, you know, like our experiences can tell us a little bit more about our values and what we want and don't want. And it is, you know, I think that really the principles work beautifully together. It's almost like a, the inner caregiver, it, you know, there's these two opposites on the end of a tug of war, you know, and they're fighting, you know, I'm out of diet culture, you need rigidity, I'm out of diet culture, you, you know, the diabetes message of rigidity and the caregiver swoops in, grabs the middle and says, I love you. I love you. I, I see these two conflicting thoughts. Will you help me care for myself? And it gets the competing sides to drop the rope and move forward with compassion and kindness and curiosity. And that, but that's why you should maintain your autonomy. You should be fully in charge of your choices and you need to have full permission to be exactly where you are. And I do think that in addition to the content that we offer and, and put that empowerment out there, but in that community setting that you really get like people listen to each other and you really understand that somebody might have a, a, a similar history or something you could relate to. And they're in a different place. Like they're, you know, they're in a bit of a different place and how they've learned and grown. And that experience and insight really shifted something in you and what you decide as your important next step. Amazing. That's fantastic. Anything else either of you want to add before we wrap it up here? I want to add on to the last thing that you said about eating disorders. We really created this whole thing. I think because of the the people we've worked with that we really work, we've worked in the eating disorder community. We work with people with disordered eating. This program is really well designed for somebody that has been, you know, traumatized by their eating disorder that, that is still struggling with eating disorder um, thoughts. And I've noticed that, you know, we have people in our group that, have a history of eating disorder. And they're just like, I cannot be restrictive. I cannot go that route. And they really responded to this program because we have really kept in mind how people have been damaged by diet culture. And we've been really just sensitive to that and to the other, you know, aspects of health or, or conditions that people could have or mental health issues that people have. We've really put that piece in there as well, where it's like, how do you navigate your diabetes concerns with other health concerns? And so, you know, we're just kind of been really proud of, of serving that those people who've really been just damaged by diet culture. Yeah, amazing. I think it's so needed. And yeah, you're helping people in such a an incredibly and I'm sure rewarding way because it's just like, it must be just so refreshing for people to find you and be like, Oh, God, finally, I can like, do this and get support with it and not be, you know, not be in a space where I'm sacrificing my mental health or I'm being triggered or I'm being put kind of back into that weight cycling cycle, for lack of a better word. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I appreciate both of you coming here and your expertise and everything. Where is the best place for people to find more about you? I'm going to put a link to your program in the show notes, which I will tell you what episode number that is at the beginning or end of this episode, because I don't know at the time of this recording. But <laughs> but it will be in the show notes for this episode. But anyways, yeah, where can where can people find more of you as well? Just go to selfcarefordiabetes.com. And whether you type in the word four or the number four, we actually bought both domains because we <laughs> <laughs> you get to pick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, check that out. You could read, you know, just more about uh, the modules and what's included and the way we've designed the support. And, you know, I'm happy to take anyone's email. Somebody can email me if you want to email me and ask questions, right? And we also have the free download, the seven surprising myths about um, diabetes and, and weight. I hope I'm saying the title yeah. right. It's something like that. But anyway, sorry. I think that's right. Yeah, you have you have the link for that, that people mm -hmm. can sort of download that and get a flavor of how we're, you know, how we're working in the program. It's just, it's a really good guide, you know, that people can, you know, use to start thinking about how they want to approach their care. So I would definitely, if people are curious, definitely grab that, that free download. Great. And where can people find you individually too? Because Rebecca, obviously you have your book and yeah. Glennis, you have your practice and everything. So show, tell everyone just about that too, so they can find you individually. Sure. Uh, bodykindnessbook.com for me, Rebecca. And I am at dare to not diet.com. Yes. Great. And Rebecca, <laughs> you have a really great podcast series on diabetes too, like that you talk about this stuff and more um, yes. that I've referred a lot of people to. So um, I guess if people are kind of wanting more inf info, then 
then they can they can also dive into that series. I'll link to that one in the show notes too. Great. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you, Summer. This was great. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Rock on. All right. So much great information in that episode. I I like I hope that you found it as helpful as I did. I feel like there's so many people who need this information. So share it far and wide if you know someone who has questions around diabetes or blood sugar and or you know if you're recovering from the diet mentality and you're not sure how to approach health or you're worried about getting diabetes or anything like that, then definitely definitely check out their pro Glennis and Rebecca's program Self-Care for Diabetes and get their free download Download the seven surprising myths about uh, diabetes and weight. Uh, both of those things are linked in the show notes as well as everything else. So their podcasts, their books, their websites, their Instagrams, all that stuff. Go to summerinandin.com forward slash 219. Thank you so much for being here today and listening. I really appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon. Rock on. I'm Summer Inanin, and I want to thank you for listening today. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Summer Inanin. And if you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts, search Eat the Rules, and subscribe, rate, and review this show. I would be so grateful. Until next time, rock on. Rock on.